Christians followed very strict and rigid guidelines that were set forth by law, they were tolerated to worship the Creator in their own chosen modes. In fact, generally speaking, Great Britain had prided herself on her measure of religious toleration for others uh, for almost a hundred years, comparative to the French, the Spanish, and so forth. But I, I suppose largely owing to the fact that most of my family had embraced the church other than the Episcopal Church, I began to think that it was unjust that these honest Protestant Christians had to pay a tax to support a church to which they themselves did not subscribe. In other words, they were tolerated, but they were truly not free to worship and to contribute as they chose to do. Well, in 17 and 76, in fact, here in this city, in the Capitol building there at the end of the main street, Virginia became the first former British colony to officially and publicly declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. We clearly could no longer have the Church of England as our state church, and uh, furthermore, we were embroiled in warfare, the most expensive business that a government may undertake. And so it was determined by the Fifth Convention, which declared independence and wrote our Constitution, and later by subsequent legislatures, that we would postpone any tax money supplied to religious teachers for the period of that war. And further, we agreed that as soon as the war were concluded, we would address the relation in our new republic of church and state, of religion and public affairs. As a technical point, the war ended just last year in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. And already, just a few months later, the question of church and state in Virginia is being very vigorously contested uh, in, uh, in Richmond Town in the General Assembly. In effect, there are three different camps as to how we should proceed in our new republic. On the one side, the old guard, largely these tidewater aristocrats, staunch Episcopalians, they wish to continue with the status quo, that which we ever knew and which generally served us well. That is to say, one single state church We'll call it by a different name, if you will, the Church of Virginia, the Protestant Episcopal Church. But everyone pays taxes to it. It alone sees to the care of the poor and the needy. There are very few supporters of that particular plan. On the opposite side of the aisle altogether, and led by my very worthy friend and associate, Mr. Jefferson, he and uh, Mr. James Madison are calling for the perpetual and complete disestablishment of religion. I suppose that means that there will no longer be any tax contributions towards religious teachers in our society. Uh, but alas, I will, of course, allow my worthy friend to speak as to the merits, or the lack thereof, of his particular scheme. I present a third plan, which I believe offers a very happy medium betwixt the two others, in that it embraces the best of the old ways under royal authority, specifically state-sponsored encouragement for the education of virtue and morality unto our citizenry, but the best of the new way in our new republic, that is, complete religious liberty for all who worship in the religion of our Savior. My plan is called the Assessment Bill of 1784. I present this bill because, friends, it is my profoundest belief that we have come to a time of great crisis and cause for great alarm. For what have we seen since we separated from Great Britain and disestablished the church in 17 and 76 for these eight years since. We have clearly seen a steady, very noticeable decline in morality and virtue in our society. Oh, <laughs> Can you deny it, Mr. Jefferson, Absolutely. sir? Absolutely. Can, can, you you... can you indeed deny it, sir? Consider, friends. Prior to hostilities with Great Britain, throughout Virginia there were 128 licensed clergymen. Today, there are only 23. Churches and meeting houses are vacant and abandoned completely, with the exception of sheep and goats grazing within the abandoned structures themselves. Vestrymen are resigning from that most important local committee of men who are charged with looking out over those who are less fortunate than they. No one willing to take their place and growing numbers of our population are absolutely refusing to contribute any money to the care of the poor and the needy, all the widows and the orphans, as a result of the late war which secured us our liberty. It is a time of crisis, for I, like many of the gentlemen with whom I serve in your government, believe that the great philosopher Montesquieu, 
The Baron de Montesquieu can be justly called the founder of the notion that politics and government can be studied like a science, and thus it can be predicted. He has written of all the various frameworks of government which have ever existed in man's history, including that of a republican form of government, such as ours, and has very clearly and convincingly determined that a republic cannot hope to survive, let alone to flourish, unless the people which comprise it are virtuous and moral and adhere to the mild and benevolent precepts of the gospel of Jesus. For if they do not, that republic will certainly suffer the same barbarous and dreadful fate as did the Republic of Rome, which, to remind you, collapsed most miserably in rivers of blood, the countryside all ablaze, and owing to rampant immorality and depravity. I would not wish to see our, our Republic die in its infancy. And thus my plan calls for a moderate, very reasonable contribution or assessment towards religion on the part of every head of household However, in breaking with the past, you will be able to choose to which church or meeting house or minister you wish those monies to be applied. In the event that you were unable to select a particular Christian denomination, you might elect to have your money supplied to a general fund, which will then go towards the erection and maintenance of public seminaries for learning, in which it is my hope that the fundamental principles of all religion will be inculcated in our society, and most especially those young men who feel compelled to minister to all the many flocks throughout the Old Dominion. By my scheme, everyone wins. I believe that denominations of all sorts will flourish around the countryside, but most importantly, we will continue to have those mild precepts of Jesus reinforced in us constantly so that we will continue to be a virtuous and moral people. As I've written before, Christianity softens the human heart. It cherishes and improves its finer feelings. It restrains men from their vices, it promotes good order and adherence to civil law. Is this not something we should encourage? My assessment bill will do so. And so therefore, gentlemen, I urge you to have a word with your delegates to the General Assembly as soon as you're able, and to persuade them to give their, their votes in favor of my assessment bill of this year, 17 and 84. I thank you for your kind attention. It is generally known that I rarely speak upon religion, even less so to write about it, and never together. But uh, when people of reason have gathered. Because it is an element of common sense to realize that when people of reason gather together to discuss religion, <laughs> they will find more to agree upon than they ever find to disagree over. It is well known that I do not inquire of a person's religion, nor do I bother any with my own. For how well we know as well, an element of good common sense, that a person's religion, their communication with their maker, is solely between them and their maker. It is a private, a private communication. And thereby, let us recognize what common sense, man has never been more free than he is now to carry that communion with his maker as these are Jews. Mr. Henry has stood before you, if you will, to deliver what I consider to be twistifications of the facts and the truths. <laughs> He has stood before you firstly to say that he has been recognized by many as a deist and thereby to follow through saying that that should infer that he is not a true Christian. Now, how many here, gentlemen, attendant to the lodges? How many here, gentlemen and ladies, attended to the Quaker meetings recognize deism not as a religion? rather as a frame of mind in recognition of the great architect of this universe, rather as a philosophy, let alone a frame of mind, as the Quakers purport. God's work on earth must truly be our own. Huh. Does that not follow the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth? Mr. Henry stands here to twistify a recognition that as we have seceded 
from the monarchical rule of Great Britain and consequently their church that I am wont to stand for a disassociation of religion. Oh, nay, indeed. I stand for a greater freedom for religion than has ever been known, particularly under the old regime, when we were governed not only by one royal family, generation after generation, governed as well by their particular parliament, one half of which is hereditary. One cannot become a member of the House of Peers unless they are the eldest Protestant Christian son of a member of the House of Peers. Those few families who own the greatest amount of land all throughout Great Britain, and mind you, as a consequence, we were governed by their particular church, the Church of England. We have disassociated ourselves with that monarchy, with that landed gentry, with that nobility, with that aristocracy, and we have installed, instituted, created what the Romans would call Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order, a new order of the ages, dedicated to self-government, the principles thereof and particularly dedicated to the preservation, protection, and defense of those inherent rights we know are given not only to us as Americans, but to the family man across this globe, not by any government, not by any leader, but rather those inherent rights given to us by nature and nature's God. And the first and foremost amongst them, the right to hold an opinion freely and to freely express one's opinion. This opportunity now is not a disassociating of religion from the lives of the people, but rather a greater freedom for it. Indeed, many of the old Church of England buildings are now vacant, but they're no longer owned by the Church of England, are they? Here's an opportunity for various sects to begin to inhabit them. Here's an opportunity for a greater freedom for religion than has ever been known in human history. Mr. Henry is to suggest that under his bill, everybody wins. <laughs> that is, everybody who pays their taxes for the support, generally, of teachers of the Christian religion. Oh, they will win, mind you, will they not? <laughs> Against those who can ill afford to pay in kind or who would rather pay their taxes to the support of seminaries of learning, Mr. Henry says, well, who will have the advantage? And I ask you that, is that liberty? Is that freedom for all? Citizens, we are speaking, are we not, of the freedom of the mind? The recognition through good common sense, our Creator has created our minds free, has He not? And free He intends it to remain, incapable of any temporal restraint. And what has history shown? But whenever any government attempts to coerce the mind of its citizen body, to compel them to furnish contributions of money for the support of one particular religion, one particular church, to compel a people to attend that particular religion and church over all others, I incur, if you will, your common sense, what has history shown? But that it leads only to hypocrisy, meanness, and bloodshed. And is a deterrent for the plan of our holy office. How many here seated this day are descendant of those or recently arrived to escape such political heresies with the corruption of religion, particularly the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, to find an asylum here in this promised land? Are we now to fall backward? <laughs> upon those old habits and customs by allowing the opportunity once more to tax opinion? That is what Mr. Henry's bill calls for. Oh, no, it does not. Oh, Henry. <laughs> uh, it is a tax, is it not? A tax, you may say, upon morality. A tax, you may say, upon virtue. A tax, indeed, upon religion for the support of teachers of one particular religion over all others. What will that lead to, I ask you? Is this land less free for those who hold a difference of opinion in religion than their fellow American? This is what it calls for. If you will, Henry knows well, as he is wont to suggest, that my particular bill for religious freedom 
is the total antithesis, if you will, of that of the Tidewater gentry who wish to return to the old regime, the support of one particular church, of one particular religion, through government, oh citizens, nay. This is a bill for religious freedom, entirely, no tax. It is supported by the bill for the general diffusion of knowledge. They are both distinct. The one for the freedom of religion, the one for the freedom for education. It is not a discussion that you may decide whether your tax dollar for the support of teachers of the Christian religion, for the support of morality, for the support of virtue, might be deterred and you place your tax dollar for the support of institutions of, of learning, seminaries of learning. Nay, citizens, this is distinct and different. There is no tax for religion under the bill for religious freedom. But yes, the bill for the general diffusion of knowledge does call for the erection of schoolhouses all throughout Virginia, providing a, a universal curriculum to be attended to by the poor as well as the wealthy, the female as well as the male. And therefore citizens apply, if you will, to the distinction of the bill that Mr. Madison and I have worked on, collaborated upon, entitled purposely the bill for religious freedom that was the title of the committee upon which mr madison and i began our collaborations the committee for religion henry has spoken well the committee was formed under the old regime to welcome the growing number of petitions being put forth by the growing number of dissenters the majority of them baptists you remember the Baptists in particular asking that they might have the opportunity to worship in the evening and to invite their slaves to worship with them. Henry, do you hear that? Not one, not one objection, not one denouncing of that great liberty. But you remember upon the committee, one gentleman did object. He said, well, gentlemen, here we are, here we are now. If we allow the Baptists to worship whenever they choose to invite anyone to worship with them, where will this end? <laughs> Remember, Henry, you were good friends with him. He said, if we allow this for the Baptists, you will see the Presbyterians will want to worship wherever they choose, invite anyone to worship with them. That will be followed by the Methodists. They will seek a religious liberty. It will be followed by the Quaker men. Oh, remember, he said, beware the Quakers. They will not only build more of their meeting houses through religious freedom, they will also build schoolhouses and try to succeed in Virginia what they've succeeded in Pennsylvania, coercing our women folk towards an education. <laughs> And you remember as well what he said? And gentlemen, I warn you, for if we allow all other sects that liberty to worship as they choose, whenever they choose, to invite anyone to worship with them, what about the Catholics? Will they now want a vote? <laughs> uh, see, I knew we'd hear it. <laughs> Citizens, my point. Are we to fall backward into those era, these last two centuries? and revisit that conflict between the Catholics and those who protested with respect to the great support of the Prince of Rome who owned a great deal of land throughout Great Britain who encouraged taxation and tithing unto the Catholic religion. Remember what the protesters rose up to exclaim. And remember what happened. They were arrested in great numbers brought to stand trial for treason under the law of the Catholic realm. They were found guilty and as a consequence burned at the stake, beheaded and hanged. Within time, the truth and the facts of the Protestants could not be denied. They overthrew the Catholic monarchy and yet citizens, they sought immediately to install the Protestant monarchy and the Church of England. And I ask you, did not in a short time did not the Catholics have every right as well to rise up and accuse the Protestant monarchy of becoming just as property, just as wealthy, just as politically involved? And what happened to those Catholics? They were arrested, brought to stand trial by the law of the Protestant realm. They were found guilty. As a consequence, they were beheaded, burned at the stake, and hanged citizens, Christians, all. Is this what we are to revisit? by providing a tax for religion. Call it a tax for morality. Call it a tax for virtue. 
I cannot help but think we must be the most abominable creature in the eye of our Creator, for surely we are the only creature in this universe capable of annihilating our own kind over a difference of religious opinion. <laughs> opinion! I ask you, citizens, how can any legislative body legislate opinion? Make a law telling an individual what they must think? And if a people allow it, what is next? <laughs> Laws telling us how we should dress. <clears throat> I have my opinion upon that here this morning. <laughs> Laws telling us what we should say, citizens. Laws telling us what we should not say. I place that in your lap, my fellow Americans. Is that freedom? No. Is that liberty? No. Henry, do you remember I replied to that particular gentleman on the Committee for Religion? I said, whether a Catholic, whether a Methodist, whether a Presbyterian, a Baptist, a Hebrew, or anyone cares to worship at any time they choose, cares to welcome anyone as well to worship with them, neither breaks my leg nor picks my pocket. Here is the opportunity when we may secure that liberty over which we shed our blood in the late war to provide a greater freedom for religion than has ever been known in human history without any tax to support it but rather the liberty to carry your opinion upon this subject as you choose and so therefore though i cannot deny that mr henry has the same liberty indeed to voice his opinion and his, as he chooses and all others who may find a fault or may have a truck with my particular opinion granted so where have you been more free or upon what land have you been more free to hold that opinion and to utter it what a divine right to hold an opinion freely and to freely express that opinion to wit To wit, as Henry well knows, Mr. Madison and I construed the last paragraph of our bill for religious freedom to recognize this inherent right as a great right in nature. And thereby, the last paragraph to wit, citizens, hold in mind in providing indeed your vote for the success of the bill for religious freedom, not the bill of an assessment for religion. And though we well know that this assembly, elected by the people for the ordinary purposes of legislation only, have no power to restrain the acts of succeeding assemblies constituted with powers equal to our own, and that therefore to declare this act to be irrevocable would be of no effect in law. Yet we are free to declare, and we do declare, that the rights hereby asserted are of the natural rights of mankind and that if any act shall be hereafter passed to repeal the present act or to narrow its operations such act will be an infringement of natural right i proclaim boldly before you that i have already sworn on the altar of god eternal hostility against all forms of tyranny over the mind of man What a delightful way Mr. Jefferson has of looking at the world. He seems to look at it the way he wishes it were, as opposed to the way that it truly is. I suppose Mr. Jefferson truly believes that the nature of man is so good, so pure, and so generous, that if left to his own devices, men will freely and happily give. The denominations of all sorts will flourish around the countryside. If that be the case, why have we not seen that in these last eight years? Or rather, the reverse. I suppose Mr. Jefferson and his imp, Mr. Madison, <laughs> truly believe that men are angels, but they are not given to sin. And yet all experience shows otherwise. Mr. Jefferson is endeavoring to deceive you, friends. He's suggesting that you are going to pay a tax to support religious teachers which otherwise you would not have to pay. But you may depend upon this. You'll have to pay the tax. You'll be paying it, however, to a sheriff or an under-sheriff on every street corner and crossroads. 
all experience hath shown. All philosophers since ancient times have all understood, have agreed, and expounded upon this principle, that man by necessity must be controlled by either a power within him or a power without of him, either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man, either by the Bible or the bayonet. Mr. Jefferson is also endeavoring to deceive you that there are going to be great numbers of our society here in Virginia who are going to be excluding, uh, excluded from being able to practice their religion as they choose to do. He suggests to you that there are a great many Jews in our country, Greeks, Turks, infidels, Catholics. This is not the case, friends. With the exception of the one Hebrew who resides here in this city, in all of Virginia. I beg pardon, Henry. I beg pardon. I cannot stand to suffer that inaccuracy. There are two in Norfolk. <laughs> Taking Mr. Jefferson and his word, three Hebrews throughout the whole of Virginia. You'd be much surprised if there are two dozen Catholics throughout our country. At a certain point in time, as their numbers might sustain a change in this assessment bill, which can always take place, of course. I still present to you that my assessment bill is best for our country at this present time. We are a Protestant Christian people, and I would wish so to remain. One other point that I should wish to make with Mr. Jefferson, it is the Holy Bible itself that teaches us those principles necessary for a virtuous republic. Consider, friends, it was here in this great city that we composed our Virginia Declaration of Rights. Sixteen different articles, individual liberties enumerated, the sixteenth of, of which applies to all men being able to worship the Creator in their own chosen modes. That all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. But there is another article to our Declaration of Rights which is particularly dear to me. In fact, I wrote it. <laughs> alone, unadvised, and unassisted. I speak of Article 15, which states that no free government or the blessing of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Where do we learn these principles, friends? Do we learn these principles from government? frugality for example <laughs> heavens no we learn these various principles from teachers of the gospel and I submit to you finally since we have not seen in these eight years any care given to the poor and the needy in our society to whom do you believe that that is eventually going to fall why clearly if not to the various parishes throughout Virginia of all various denominations it's going to fall to government Forbid it, Almighty God. Mm -hmm. Again, Colonel Henry has never had a greater liberty to express his opinion than he has right now before all of you. And yet, lest we forget who must be the ultimate judge. Colonel Henry is wont to stand here and suggest to you, are we to allow for a, a government to, to seek its devices beyond frugality, to become excellent in expending, and yet forget that through Mr. Henry's bill, we will be supplying our government with further funds? For what? The regulation of opinion. Again, citizens, this is in your lap. I stand here freely to purport the wisdom of the ages, that indeed this is a new world order, a new order of the ages, in which our future is now in our hands, the hands of the people. Does that mean specifically one particular religious opinion over another, or the freedom for all to engage their liberty and live their lives as they choose? My bill suggests not a separation of church and state, which in itself would imply a separating of religion from our lives, from the lives of those we elect to government, but rather distinctly a separation between church and state. Thereby allowing more freedom for the civil authority to attend to its duty. But what is the duty of the civil authority? To purport religious opinion, to regulate opinion, 
Citizens, the only duty of any government and its laws is simply to protect us from injury by one and the other. Otherwise, to leave us free to pursue our own industry and our own improvement. And will not our improvement be the more successful when the ecclesiastical laws are free to attend to their purpose? The administration of the human soul simply to do good unto another as you would desire to have done unto yourself and solely to love your neighbor as you should love yourself. Is that not the sum of all religion? And where in human history has it had a better opportunity to thrive and reveal the beneficent nature of man rather than to draw the, the wool over our eyes to a mistrust of our own vision? Here's the opportunity for people to do more good than they have ever done before. Amen. Opportunity, but no encouragement. Oh. I wonder, Mr. Jefferson, if you might be willing to receive a question or two from our hearers as to the various points of our own uh, differing bills or upon any other head for that matter. In fact, as the ancient Romans said, Vox Populi, Vox Dei, the voice of the people is voice the voice of God. of God. Their innate will speak, yes. May I